Good evening and welcome to the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute's May Science Hour. I'm Chris Bolzan, Executive Director. Tonight, you will hear from Dr. Nadia Rosenthal, who is the Scientific Director of the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. Dr. Rosenthal will share with us her incredible work studying genetic variation in mice to better understand human disease. And we are so honored to have her with us tonight as we wrap up the spring season of the GMGI Science Hour. GMGI addresses critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. By bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront, GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. A strategy triad guides our work. A research team led by Dr. Andrea Bodner, our Donald G. Combe Science Director, pursues a platform of advanced molecular biology and genomic technologies that is expanding our understanding of the world's oceans and accelerating discoveries that impact fisheries and human health. Our education initiative led by Dr. John Doyle prepares recent high school graduates to become trained lab technicians through our Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. In a few short weeks, we will graduate the Academy class of 2021, our fifth cohort, and we are incredibly proud of them. Through our science community work, we actively promote conditions that encourage the establishment of a vibrant science community in and around Gloucester. This includes our annual GMGI Science Forum, which will take place in person this year on October 30th, and a second conference we will introduce to Gloucester in the fall, focused on innovations in science education and biomanufacturing workforce development. We were honored just yesterday with the exciting news that we have been awarded a $100,000 Cummings Foundation grant to support our science community work and continue to build a science cluster on Boston's North Shore. Tonight, I encourage you, to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions you might have for Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you all so much for tuning in and continuing to share in our excitement for science education. A special thank you to our sponsors, the 1911 Trust Company, managing North Shore and Boston family wealth for six generations, and the James and Gail Bacon Family Trust. I'm going to turn the screen now over to GMGI co-founder and board member, Dr. Mark Vidal. Mark is a professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School and is the founding director of the Center for Cancer Systems Biology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Mark? Yes, thank you, Chris. Beautiful introduction. So it's a uh, thank you all for uh, joining the last science hour of, uh, of the year before the summer. Uh, today, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce a great friend of mine, uh, Dr. Nadia Rosenthal. So uh, I'll first uh, describe briefly uh, uh, the sort of the you know, general lines of her research um, and her career. So Nadia was actually working in the 70s uh, with a team that cloned and sequenced some of the first human genes. Um, she went on to get a uh, PhD from Harvard Medical School and then later directed a lab uh, uh, over at Harvard. And then she did something that not too many scientists do, which actually kind of happens to her a little bit more than average. She went to Europe to direct one of the really big mouse genetics labs of Europe in Monte Rotondo, right next to Rome. And then she did again, after really succeeding at that for a number of years, she had to move again and she went to Australia and she did it again, reintroduced mouse genetics in Australia in a couple of different institutes. It's a little bit too long to explain all the details, but she revolutionized uh, uh, mouse genetics while, while doing that. And what's really interesting for us, our uh, crowd here of GMGI is we've told you many, many times, David Walt, myself and others about uh, the sort of the beacons that we use as really, really successful labs on the East Coast, uh, like Cold Spring Harbor Lab, we've told you about, of course, Woods Hole and Jackson Lab, 
Remember, we're sort of geographically on that line. It turns out that Nadia is the scientific director of the Jackson Lab up there in Bar Harbor, Maine. And what's also very interesting is she actually lived in Gloucester. That's actually how we met in the 90s. Um, she lived in Gloucester for quite a, a number of years. So she's really one of ours. And we are having her back tonight, uh, I should say. And that's making us all very, very happy. I won't list all the different honors and awards that uh, Nadia got. You just have to... Google her, go to Wikipedia or uh, our own website, but it's very impressive. She's a member of uh, a, a handful of academies where she was elected. Uh, she got honoris causa degrees from a bunch of places. It's very, very impressive. She really did amazing, amazing work in mouse genetics. Now, the connection then, one more connection to all of us here is, of course, what we just went through since last uh, winter with COVID. And as soon as Nadia realized that the, the, about the sort of the amplitude of, of the problem, she realized how uh, mice could be a really good model to study sort of the intricate mechanisms that the virus is actually employing to do the, the harm that it's, that, it's, that it's doing. So anyway, in summary, Nadia has an incredible career of the last four last decades She's been a friend and a Gloucester person all that uh, for a long time. And again, Nadia, it's really a great pleasure to have you back here. Uh, thank you for accepting th this invitation. The title of your talk is Exploring COVID-19 Host Genetics with Mice. Take it away. Thank you so much, Mark, <clears throat> for that wonderful introduction. Um, I, I, this is a very special event for me simply because the idea that I could be giving a talk, a scientific talk uh, in Gloucester uh, is just um, a particularly amazing concept. Um, and the only real regret is that I am not there uh, to uh, smell the ocean uh, where I lived for so many years on Cape Ann. And speaking of that, <clears throat> I'm, going to, um, I'm going to embarrass Mark Mark will remember something about this house. Those of you who live in Gloucester also probably know this house. That's the American Legion with the Joan of Arc statue behind. That's the white building. And this was my husband's and my home for many years on 21 Middle Street, Gloucester. And we got married in the living room right there. And Mark was there. Um, and I uh, just, it occurred to me today that I had to dig up a picture of this wonderful old house, which I really regretted leaving. It was probably the most beautiful house I've ever lived in. Um, however, I did uh, sort of land on my feet after having gone around the world, because when I got the job at Jack's, I realized that I could live in this house. Now, this house is actually a, an old rickety mansion on the uh, co coast of Maine on an island that has no roads on it. And the most extraordinary thing was I discovered was that the captain who built the brick house at 21 Middle Street was actually friends and colleagues with the family that built this house, who the, the money for this house came from a railway magnate who built the railway system that allowed Captain Rogers, who built the brick house, to unload his treasures from the Suriname onto trains that would then take it up the East Coast. So it's possible that the two people who built these two houses actually knew each other, which is sort of a mind boggling thing. Anyway, <clears throat> enough about that. I just thought it was an interesting story to tell. Let's get on to some science. One of the things that um, really has uh, struck me over the years is how much we live in the middle of a viral world. And I used to be a virologist way, way back. And it's really interesting because these animals or non-animals or life forms, if you wanna call them that, are really companions to us. Um, they don't just kill us, they coexist with us. They've actually contributed to a lot of our evolutionary development as the human race uh, sort of diversified out of Africa. They've influenced our immune system profoundly. They move around between people and then they can live actually in our genome with either good or bad effects, but they do tend to change our biology and that can work in a number of ways. 
<clears throat> now, of course, most of the time we think about viruses as really bad news. In fact, here's a list of the bad news. There's an incredible number of viruses that we already know about, and we're not going to get rid of these guys anytime soon. Um, however, the uh, virus that we're dealing with right now is a kind of special case. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 seems to have a particularly um, uh, uh, large appetite. <clears throat> it likes to go all over your body. And as a result, there are a number of different ways in which people exhibit their, um, their susceptibility <clears throat> to COVID-19. So common symptoms on the left, we all know about these, some of us have experienced them, and the more serious ones on the right, which can lead to all sorts of real problems and even death. And it's all due to this little virus, which by now everybody has seen. <clears throat> There's a sort of a slinky on the inside, which is RNA, nucleic acid, surrounded by proteins. And we um, <clears throat> draw it like this because there are these proteins that sit on the surface that sort of look like <clears throat> something out of a golf course, but are known as spike proteins. And they are really the, uh, the key to the whole problem. So there's the little virus sitting near a cell. This is one of your cells in your body. And every one of those cells has a number of proteins that stick out of the membrane. And in this case, the most important one for this story is called ACE2. It doesn't really matter what it normally does, but the virus co-ops it. The virus knows how to do a kind of a lock and key mechanism, which opens the door, allows it in, and then all sorts of mayhem occurs because what viruses can do is co-opt all of the activity that a cell normally uses for its own uh, metabolism to make more of the virus. So SARS-CoV-2 enters the cell, starts making more RNA, starts making more protein, but the stuff that it wants, not the stuff that the cell needs, and pretty soon the cell is full of virus and it explodes out and where you ended up with one virus to begin with, you now have thousands coming out. And that is basically how viruses normally work. And this virus is no exception. The problem is that it seems to be able to go everywhere. And these are some of the many tissues that we now know are, sub, are, are uh, susceptible to viral entry and infection. And of course, this is why there are so many different horrendous diseases associated with this virus. So the big question is, what are the clinical realities here and how can we deal with these in a way to understand this virus better? Because although we are beginning to see a little relief with the vaccines, it's likely that there will be another pandemic at some point. And so we really need to understand how this works. So the really interesting thing about this particular virus, as I said, is that it produces such a diverse panoply of diseases and outcomes, anything from a mild cold right on to ICU. Um, same is true about what we call comorbidities, which are things sort of diseases that come along for the ride. And we used to think that younger, healthier people were much less susceptible to COVID-19. But we now know that that age is, is slowly reducing and reducing so that more and more people in their 30s and 40s are getting sick. And what's more, they're getting sick and often ended up ending up with a long-term problem. And as we've heard, long COVID is this sort of an, um, amorphous collection of things that people end up feeling months after the initial infection. Now, the important thing for this talk is that it's the response of the host, and in this case, that's us human beings, that defines the severity of the disease. It's not the virus. The virus is the same, whether it infects you or me, but we may be very different in the way we respond. And of course, the big question for us geneticists is, are the differences between us, the genetic differences between us, the real reason why some people are susceptible and some people walk away from it with no symptoms at all? Now, obviously, because I work at the Jackson Laboratory, which is really a haven for all sorts of different kinds of mice that are used as models for human beings, it occurred to me when this whole thing started that we really needed to use the incredible information we have about these little guys and all the different ways in which they differ, maybe to study the differences in humans. So here's a very canonical white lab mouse. I happen to think they're unbelievably cute, but if you're not into mice, you probably are freaking out right now. And what I'm gonna do is freak you out even more because look at all these guys. 
These are just some of the 11,000 different mice that we have wandering around the Jackson Laboratory. Well, they're in cages, but I like to think of them as wandering around. And they are all different in various ways. They're all mice. So they're all a species that we can study and they can actually interbreed with each other. But each one of these mice has a whole different story. So one of the reasons that we use mice for studying disease, and this is no exception for COVID-19, is that you can study mechanism because you can actually look at a mouse after it's died and you can look into its organs. Um, you can also look at complications that might arise and understand them with many different mice that are exactly the same genetically. So you know that it isn't anything about the genetics and then you can see whether it's something they ate or whatever. You can also follow up for long periods of time because mice live for up to two to three years. You can develop new diagnostic approaches using mice and you can also test new therapeutics and vaccines and antivirals. So they're really, really useful. But we have one big problem in this case. And this is what I realized when I started reading about a year and two months ago, which was that mice don't get this disease. So that's just a little problem for us. And the reason they don't get it is because that little receptor I talked about, that protein on the surface of the cell of a mouse called ACE2, very, very similar to humans. In fact, most of our genes are identical between humans and mice. But in this particular case, this gene has somehow changed slightly, just enough so that the virus can't lock and key. It's as if you got the wrong key, you went in and it's the wrong lock and you can't get in. So you can feed or put uh, this virus into the nose of a mouse and it'll just sneeze it out and won't get sick at all. So how did we fix this problem so that we could study what goes on when the virus does infect an animal like the mouse? Well, that's where genetic engineering comes in. We could add a little gene that was the human gene, which we know will make the cells that it is sitting in susceptible to this virus. And this actual mouse had been made many years ago to study the SARS epidemic, which occurred back in 2007. And so we could get these mice from the uh, very uh, generous person who had made them and rapidly start to increase the numbers of these mice so that we could send them out. And indeed, they were susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. They got COVID-19, but they got it so badly that they actually died within a week. So that's not good for the mouse. It's also not good for us because if we don't really want to study just the first five or six days of an infection, we want to study the long history of infection. So great for studying a vaccine. You give this mouse a vaccine and then you give it the virus. And if it's alive, you know the vaccine really, really worked because we know how devastating the virus would be otherwise. But it wasn't the perfect model. Now, it just so happens that we can follow the sort of changes within a mouse when it is being infected by a virus by a couple of really easy tests. So I'm just going to show you how this looks. So I'm not going to you know, bore you with too much data. I just want you to be able to see the real data as it sits here. So what we're looking at on the left is the weight of the mouse over days. So you see on the horizontal axis, it says days post challenge. That's days of the week, let's say. And then on the vertical axis is weight. And what we're looking at is the percentage of the original weight that is lost. And you can see over time that whereas the green dots uh, are a mouse that is the control that never saw the virus, if you put a little bit of the virus in, you get the pink dots. And if you put a lot of the virus in, you get the red dots. And what you're seeing is this mouse is losing weight fast. Indeed, 80% of its weight is what all it has by the end. So it's lost 20% of its weight. Now that's a lot of weight to lose. And mice only have about 35 grams of weight. And what you can see, what that is then indicative of, it doesn't necessarily cause death, but it shows that the mouse is getting sick because mice love to eat. And if they don't eat, they're very sick. And what you see on the right is the survival curves of these mice. And you can see that no, even with the, the lower dose of virus, they really don't do very well and all die by six or seven days. So um, what to do about this? Well, we have a kind of a theory at Jackson Laboratory, and it goes like this. We have these wonderful mice that have been 
incredibly well characterized. So this is the blue mouse. This is, it's actually a C57 black six mouse. That's what we call these sort of the mouse, the, the most famous mouse. And we know tons and tons about this mouse. So everybody uses it to study disease, but there's a problem. This mouse is just one mouse and we're trying to study the whole human race. And as we know, everybody's different. And we know that more and more now because we're studying people at their genetic level and we can see that we're all individual. So what do we do about this? Well, at Jax, it's easy. We just get more mice off the shelf and we have all sorts of mice and they're all different. And so the question is, can we use the diversity at the level of genetics in the mouse colonies that we have to model better the extraordinary diversity in a human when you're uh, faced with a, uh, a population of humans and a disease like COVID-19? So here's what we decided to do back last spring. We used the mouse that we knew was too sick uh, when we got when we infected it, and that's the little gray guy on the left. And the little star is just to uh, um, indicate that this mouse is transgenic for a human gene, and that therefore it can be infected. We cross that mouse by breeding to all of these other genetically diverse mice, and then what we do is simply look at the offspring. Now you know how this works. You get half your genes from your mother and half your genes from your father. Same with the mice. So what these little uh, offspring are is a mixture of their mommy's, mo uh, mommy's uh, genes, which are all the guys on the right, those are the females, and the daddy's genes, which is the guy on the left, which has the transgene. So he passes that transgene on to the, to the babies so they can be infected but they're different from one another because each of these crosses gives you a different combination. So it's a kind of a, a controlled way of studying genetics. And the big question was, will they respond differently to infection? Now we hit another problem. We at Jackson Laboratory up in Bar Harbor in the middle of one of the most beautiful national parks in the world cannot and do not work with infectious diseases. One reason is because we're right in the middle of a, you know, a very uh, uh, sort of special place and we don't want to be dealing with pathogenic viruses with three million uh, tourists showing up every, every uh, summer to see the beautiful mountains and the ocean. Um, but at the same time, we actually don't really um, want to uh, deal with the uh, problem that you have when you're dealing with a, an infectious disease, which is that you have to literally work in a completely different environment. And I'll show you what that environment looks like in a minute. So what, he did, what we did is we called up the National Institutes of Health and said, we really think these mice could be useful. Will you test them for us? Now, where does the National Institute of Health test uh, scary viruses? Out in the middle of Montana at the Rocky Mountain Labs. This is a very famous place. This is where they do all the work on things like Ebola and Zika and other really horrible viruses, even much worse than SARS-CoV-2. And when you're dealing with this, this is what you have to wear. You have to look like you just landed on the moon. You have to be completely in a spacesuit because you don't want to have any contact with the virus. So it's a whole different way of doing science and you have to be very well trained to do this. Thank God we found um, my colleagues there were interested in this problem and agreed to take our mice and infect them and see what happens. So I'm going to show you what we found. Okay, so now you know how to read these curves at the bottom. These are those Per survival curves. I'm not showing you weight, but you can pretty much imagine what's going on. And we were so excited. This is, these are just three of the many mice that we actually generated with, and then were tested by Sonia Best and Shelley Robertson, who are two fantastic virologists out in Montana. So what we're looking at are those offspring. So on the left, you see something called B6 times PWK. PWK was one of the, of the girls, one of the mothers. This mouse was so resistant that every mouse, except for one that we actually gave the virus to, and you see the virus, we, we make them smell it. Um, it goes into their um, nose, just like we get it in. Um, every mouse walked away, just walked right away. Didn't even get sick, didn't even have a cough, nothing, didn't lose any weight. The middle one, which was sensitive, is the one I've shown you before. That's the one you know now by now it's called the black six and it's the original mouse and you can see they're all going really badly by uh, six to eight days 
And then we started finding all sorts of other things. So some of the mice had a very different um, outcome if, if they were male versus if they were female. So this NOD mouse, when we crossed it in to the transgenic mouse, the black six mouse, ended up being fine if they were girls, but really bad shape if they were boys. So this is what we call sexual dimorphism when we get two different results with the same genetics, but just different sexes. So this is something having to do with hormones or all sorts of other possibilities. And not only that, we found all sorts of really interesting things inside these mice when we looked. So for instance, when a mouse was um, susceptible, you can see on the left some lung tissue from this mouse and you can see the holes in it. That's not the way lung tissue should look. And that's because if you see on the right, that's lung tissue with a lot of virus in it, which is here marked red. So these animals were full of virus. And here's an even more interesting result. Now we know that some people get COVID brain, they get fog, brain fog. We, we know about that. We know about how you lose your taste and uh, smell for a while. Well, we got some clues about that. So what we're looking at here is a cross section of a mouse brain. And when I talk about a mouse brain cross section, I'm talking about imagining that you're looking straight through the nose right out the back. And so you what's called a sagittal section, you're just looking straight through. And what you're seeing here is the back of the brain on the left and the front of the brain on the right. But what you're seeing on the left is that red dye is showing that the virus gets all over the brain. And yet, if you look at the brain in terms of what's wrong with it, you see that the only place where you can pick up problems is in the hindbrain. And you see that the blow up there is vascular thrombosis, which just simply means that there are problems of clotting inside of the small vessels of your brain. And guess where your sense of taste and smell are? Your hindbrain. So this mouse may give us a clue as to why people lose their sense of taste and smell. It's not because of their nose, it's because the olfactory bulb, which is where all of that information goes right off the bat after you've smelt something, is right next to the hindbrain. Anyway, we don't know that that's true yet, but I'm telling you this is all unpublished data I'm showing you here. Okay, so this is just to give you a feel for the differences we saw in eight of these animals. And you can just look up and down, you don't even have to read it, but you can see that some animals lose weight and don't actually die. Some animals don't lose very much weight and they die. Some animals are different, whether it's male or female. And some animals down at the bottom, our famous PWK mouse is asymptomatic and walks away. So this was super exciting because we know so much about these animals. We know exactly how they are related genetically and we know all about their uh, other characteristics. So now we have a full set of data with which we can start to correlate what's going on with the, um, with the viral infections. So eight genetic, genetics combinations, eight distinct outcomes, really exciting. Now, why is that PWK mouse so good at, at surviving? Here's an interesting piece of data. So what you're seeing here is um, a, a viral load, okay? So what you do is you, when the mouse dies, you look at their lung and you look at their brain in this case, and you ask how many actual viral particles do we find in those animals in the lung and in the brain? So how to read this is that all the circles are girls and all of the squares are boys. And what you see on the left is the girls at three days and six days from a PWK cross, and the boys are three days and six days from the PWK cross next door. And what I've got those blue arrows is to show you is that at three days, there's a lot of virus in the lung. And by six days, these animals have cleared it out. So these animals take one look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus and say, out of here. These are not vaccinated animals. They're not even particularly set up to uh, recognize this virus because they've never seen it before because it normally doesn't go into a mouse and yet they're clearing it. We need to know what's going on with those PWK mice because those are the asymptomatic humans that we all want to be. Now, interestingly, nothing gets to the brain at all in these animals down at the bottom, you can see, and that's not surprising because the virus is only in the lung for three days and then it's gone. Now over on the right is the original animal that we know dies. And we show that here, 
the virus never clears at all and the animals are dead after five days. And you start seeing it in the brain at that point. And there are numerous pictures like this for all the different mice we looked at, but I just try to give you a feel for the kinds of information that we can get just by looking at the most basic outputs. Anyway, the golden star is PWK. This is the animal that we all need to be. Now, can we get better than this? Can we actually make more different kinds of mice that would uh, uh, give us even broader spectrum of different kinds of, of responses? And the answer is, of course we can, because we can keep breeding these mice and mixing up their genes until they're really, really, really different from each other. And then we can do things like feed them various kinds of antivirals and see if that helps them. So the sky's the limit now that we have the setup. Um, it's early days, and we obviously would also like to play around with other aspects of the mouse genome. And that's because we know that ACE2, this famous receptor that the virus recognizes on the surface of the cell, is only one of many different proteins shown here in the little sort of flesh-colored boxes that the virus needs, that are cell proteins that the virus needs to do its nefarious job which is to take over everything in the cell and make more of itself. And it also needs to be able to evade the human immune system. So can we make a mouse that has a human immune system? You bet, we have plenty of them. And not only that, we are now making mice that have humanized versions of all these other genes. So ultimately, we sort of want to make this mouse as the perfect laboratory for understanding how viruses infect these animals and, and use that as a proxy. Next is COVID not, it's not just for two days or four days or six days. There are people who are experiencing years worth of differences in the way that their bodies respond to the virus and keep um, various malfunctions. So ultimately we wanna take these different little mice and breed and just let them go. Not all of them will make it, but the ones that do make it might show us different kinds of long COVID symptoms that we can then study and see how the genetics is affecting people. Why is this important? Because ultimately we could be prepared for the next pandemic by knowing more about this virus and how it affects our uh, own genetics. If we know our own genetics, which we all will very soon, we'll all know our sequence, then we could actually predict whether we're going to be more susceptible to a common cold, to uh, uh, you know, um, a, a herpes virus, to hepatitis C. We could actually tell somebody right from the get-go whether they were likely to be more or less uh, uh, susceptible to the kinds of diseases that you get when these viruses infect you. And as a result, we could then be much more precise about the way in which we treat the, the patients that do get sick. So that's really the end of the story. It's really a very small snapshot of a very preliminary study that we're doing up at the Jackson Laboratory, but I just wanted to give you a feeling for the excitement we're feeling about the way in which this has panned out. And none of this could have been done without a lot of the people that you're seeing here, wonderful scientists. The ones with red around them actually made the mice and worked on the mice and took care of the mice. And at the bottom, Steve Holland, who's my hero, who's um, the head of the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases and has funded all this work, was also uh, a hero because he lent me two fabulous scientists, Sonia Best and Shelley Robertson, who did all the work. In any case, I wanna thank the mice because they're wonderful and exciting and incredible little animals and I just love them all. I'm a bit of a mouse fanatic. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Please do visit us. That's the Jackson Laboratory down there. This was taken from the top of Cadillac Mountain in the middle of Acadia National Park. It's a good place to visit and I won't even make you hold a mouse. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia. That was really beautiful, uh, beautiful picture. Um, we have quite a number of questions for you. So this is really gorgeous, right? Um, to the point, I'm gonna start, I have a bunch of questions myself, but I'm gonna start of course with the Q&A. Uh, it's, it's a long list and um, one person actually gives their name uh, it's Richard Tharon, and he's asking, how can we use computer models and cell cultures to substitute animal models to save time and money in preclinical research? So in other words, 
could you have put yourself a little bit upstream of the mice? Um, and in fact, yeah, and trust? the answer to that really brings up a very important point, which is that genetics isn't just important in an organism, which is the way you think about it. You think of your own genetics, you think about fruit fly genetics or mouse genetics or the genetics of corn or the gen you know genetically modified organisms. But genetics is just as important inside cells because the way a cell actually works is dependent upon its genetic material. So if you have a cell from one person and a cell from another person, you can study the way in which those viruses infect that cell. And you can understand then how it is that the virus can or can't get into that cell. So that first critical yeah. moment when the virus gets in, you could study that in cell culture, but you can't study that in cell culture until you know whether the animal or the person is susceptible or not. So you need to know something about the actual response of the organism, and yeah. then you can move into the cells. And uh, one of the really exciting things about the mouse uh, uh, panels that we have is that we are creating uh, embryonic stem cells uh, and that means we can create any tissue we want out of each of these mice. So they're mouse embryonic stem cells. They're just like human embryonic stem cells in the sense that you can make different tissues out of that. You can even make a mouse out of that, which is one thing that we can do in animals that we won't do in, in humans. But the idea is that you can marry the really spectacular work you can do in cell culture with the genetics, the underlying genetics, which isn't a combination that occurs very often in cell biology, and learn a whole lot about how things how things actually work at the cellular level. Um, now, the the computational aspect of all of this is is sitting underneath everything I'm telling you. So I didn't bother to tell you about it, but the way in which we understand why the PWK mouse is different from the Black Six mouse is through bioinformatic analysis of the changes that we see between the two mice at the genetic level. And those bioinformatic uh, tools can be used just as well on cells as they can on mice. Um, so that, that I think that says yes. <laughs> That's a perfect segue to the next one, which by the way, there's so many questions. I won't be able to go through all of them and I apologize to some of them, to some of the people who asked them. But I don't mind gonna... answering them afterwards. You can send them to well, me. That's also true. Yeah, we can do email. But what I'm also going to try to do is to basically take two or three questions and just do one of, you know, synthesize them. And, and you just raised the point. People are asking, at least five people have asked, how did you pick the eight or nine? I forgot. Uh, backgrounds that you use. So wow. it, there's the big number, 11,000 at, 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 at the Jackson lab. How do you reduce it down to something operational and, and, and viable and informative? Um, uh, that is a great question, <clears throat> and there there was a, a lot of thought that went into those eight lines we used, but it wasn't an accident. We just didn't pick them out of the basket. About 20 years ago, several really smart people at JAX decided to make a much more controlled and structured group of genetically diverse animals. So they said, <clears throat> why don't we use the sort of small alpine village idea where you have a small group of people that end up intermarrying and what you end up with what's called founder effects. If you're a geneticist, you know what I'm talking about. It just means that you have um, qualities that show up in many people in a smaller community because they are more closely related. You can think of Iceland, you can think of the Mormons in Utah, and, um, and in Finland, they also have a lot of these founder effects. Yes. So what we decided to do was to take eight mice, start with eight. So you imagine eight mice go to an alpine village and they decide to start a village. <laughs> of mice. And um, it doesn't take very long for mice to start a village, as you all know, if you've had mice in your house. They have extraordinary quick uh, reproduction times and they're very, very effective at it. And so the concept was that if we crossed all of these eight mice between each other a lot, we could end up with a really rich set of diverse changes and versions of different genes. And once we got to a state where there were hundreds and hundreds of these different versions of the eight founders all mixed up like confetti, 
we then decided to inbreed each of these different lines so that we could have reproducible mice. I mean, it's sort of like if you think about dogs, you have collies and you have poodles and you have, but they're yeah. all dogs, right? Yeah. And so then you have these mice that are super closely related to each other, but distinct. Then we did tests. I wouldn't say we, it was these other wonderful faculty of mine. They did tests to ask, are these mice really diverse or are they all really inbred? And then, you know, we don't, we don't really want inbred and it's not about, everyone knows you shouldn't marry your cousin and all that. Well, it turns out that these mice were actually very, very different. They were different genetically and they were different in all these different ways. And they have been looked at by many, many different labs around the world. And there is a huge amount of data on the mice that were generated from those eight founders. So we thought we'll start with the eight founders mm -hmm. and then we will diversify. And we thought if we can't see any differences between the eight founders, then we know our theory is just junk, that there isn't going to be a good way to model the differences between humans. So, you know, it was a bit of a crapshoot. And when we got the answer we got, we got very excited because now we can really diversify and look at hundreds of different mice. And we often at JAX do an experiment where we test something in 500 different mice that all belong to that same Alpine village. So that's how we chose those eight mice. So of course, there's a, that's fantastic. A lot of uh, people are asking about, uh, of course, the genetic background and particularly Dylan Combe is asking, um, what do you think it was about the winning mouse strand that survived, a strain probably he meant, that survived the best from COVID, genetically speaking? Uh, and Shelly Trigg is asking a sort of a related question. Hi, Shelly. Uh, are there sexual dimorphic responses to COVID in humans uh, or, or is it just in mice, that, that huge difference that you saw? Can you? Yeah, I can comment. Uh, right? Yeah, I can comment. Let's ask, let's go for the second question first, just because it's an easier one. And that is that we see huge differences in these mice because they are really, really not great models for humans yet. These are highly inbred mice. Most of these mice have been on the shelf, the same mice being bred to the same mice for decades. And as you know, inbred animals have problems. We all know, you know, German shepherds have weak hips, et cetera, et cetera. It's just like that with mice. And so, although we are excited about the differences between these inbred strains, we are not surprised by the really extreme differences in certain cases, like all the males die and all the females don't or the other way around. What we're expecting is to see much more subtle differences when we start looking at all the progeny of all those eight lines crossed between each other. So when you, you know, so that's why it is that, for instance, Great Danes are huge and Chihuahuas are small. We don't see that kind of variation in, in you know, wild dogs. And it's because we've been breeding selectively, selectively, selectively for things. And that's what we've done with the mice. So we're going to see extremes. But the idea here is that genetics is telling us something about the way this virus attacks the mouse, just like genetics is telling us something about the way the virus attacks humans. And that winning mouse has obviously something different. And if you want to place a bet on what it is, I bet you it's something about their immune system, because that's usually how an animal combats a virus. And indeed, just recently, I think this week, there was a new paper that came out that suggested that one of the most important things about the way the body um, responds to SARS-CoV-2 and fights the virus is with what we call the innate immune system, which is your inflammatory response. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And if that's the case, then there may very well be a very rapid re inflammatory response in that mouse. And that's what we're looking for now. Because I can tell you that the mouse that succumbs very quickly, the original mouse, the gray mouse, has an extraordinarily um, uh, retarded response to the virus. So if you look at the immune system of that mouse, even seven days out, there's still not very many of those in, innate immune cells in the lung. It's as if the virus gets in and somehow, I don't know, it's like a guerrilla warfare thing. It gets in and, it, and, 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 the, and the immune system doesn't see it. So, so now I'm going to interrupt you like I would if we were having dinner. What about other viruses? Is that strain particularly sensitive to a wide range of infections? Sorry. Um, we don't know because 
that strain has not really been used particularly for infectious disease because these are crazy mice that we have at the Jackson Laboratory. What I'm doing now is we're breeding up every one of these mice because we're going to publish this result as soon as I've stopped talking and start writing. (laughs) And then we're going to show, we're going to try to shove these viruses uh, these viruses these mice into as many labs as we can to learn as much as we can because right now most people who do infections work on one strain called Balbsi and they don't look at the PWK mouse which is a kind of a weird mouse i mean we picked it out of the blue so um tune in it's going to it's going to be an interesting couple of years now that we'll we have stay, to we'll stay in touch. So Chris Balzan, by the way, if you think it's going too long, just let me know. I don't know exactly how to titrate it. The talk was rather short and there are a lot of questions. And if people are staying on, I, I'm fascinated by Nadia's answer. So if we can keep going, is that okay? Fine with yeah. me. Okay. So, and Nadia, is it okay with you? Perfect. <laughs> okay. So then now we're going to go a little bit on the ACE2 issue. Lots of questions about that. And I could sort of classify them into two groups. One is why the hell are mice so resistant? In other words, if ACE2 does the same job naturally in mice or very similar, then what happens in human, which I actually am not aware of that myself. I don't know if that's true or not. How did they, did they become resistant? Is that something that that was selected? Is that an advantage? Uh, You know, why this difference? That, you know, that's a that's a very complicated question. It's a great question, but it's a complicated question because we don't really know whether there was some kind of pressure, selective pressure on the mouse to weed out the mice that had the human version of this so that only the mice that didn't have the human version survived. I mean, that's evolution. That's Darwinian right. evolution. That could be true. But, you know, this is a new virus. We're not sure that mice have seen this virus before. It came from bats. Bats are related to mice, so there's a possibility that there was something there. When we looked at the structure of this gene in as many organisms as we could and lined it up, what we found was that the mouse was actually one of very few organisms that had a very distinct ACE2 protein structure, which is, of course, Um, reflective of a difference in the gene. And so we looked to see whether we could pick certain things in the mouse gene that we could tweak and turn back into the human gene without just taking out the whole gene and putting in a human gene. We could ask, can we can we tweak it at this position and that position and make it look a little more human here and a little more human here? And maybe then the spike protein will go, oh, I can see that's a lock I can open up with my key, kaboom, and then we'll go. And so we're doing those experiments. I just don't have the results because the mice, I was just talking to the guys making the mice this afternoon and we're just getting those mice ready to go. Now, if those mice with a little tiny change can see the virus, that tells us uh, people who are interested in evolution that this is probably a pretty recent change and it might've just been random and that it just got stuck in the mouse genome because why not? And even if the mouse hadn't seen that particular virus before, maybe it saw another coronavirus and maybe another coronavirus was also capable of dealing with that same uh, structure and could get in. And so only the mice that had the change could right. survive. So, right. you know, they're, it's, I'm waving my hands because that's exactly the only thing I can do. I don't know. <laughs> so two more. And one is related to ACE2. It's a really fantastic question from Chip and Margaret Ziering, And I say hello to them. How do you alter the DNA? Is it by CRISPR? How much control do you have over where the human ACE2 gene goes? Do you sequence the offspring to ensure that they all receive? You get it, right? So how do you technically make sure that this is all done? Sounds like (laughs) scientists. Yeah, those are great questions. So um, we um, obviously do most of our genetic engineering with CRISPR. Um, We also use Prime Editor, which is a new technology, which is for those of you who think about this stuff, uh, instead of a double-stranded cut, it cuts a single strand, which allows you to do more delicate manipulations without losing the potential loss of the piece in the middle when you have two different double-stranded cuts. That's just technology. But in any case, those are techniques we use routinely. Um, And what what we've done uh, recently is that we uh, took that uh, ACE, 
two gene driven by another promoter called K18. You saw it on the slide. I didn't go into it, but it's an epithelial promoter. It doesn't drive the gene in the same way that the endogenous promoter drives the gene. That is to say the ACE2 has a whole regulatory uh, sort of setup when it's sitting in its own little nest on the genome. It's got its, its, its turn off and its turn on signals, and they are very specific in different kinds of tissues. And what's cool is that we went and looked in the mouse and in the human, and we found that if it's up in one gene, uh, sorry, if that gene is up regulated high, there's a lot of the product in one tissue in the human, it's the same in the mouse. So it's mapping absolutely the same in terms yeah. of how the gene is regulated. Now, um, the idea there was maybe what we need to do is not to have a random integration of all of these transgenes, eight in a row is what the one is in, the, is in Paul McRae's uh, original mouse. Let's just put one in and let's put it into a kind of neutral territory. So they, we dumped it into the Rosa 26 locus. I'm just using this in case there are scientists around and they get, get they, their interest in the detail. And theoretically that would have isolated it from any other spurious activity and would give the mouse only one copy of the gene. And maybe that would calm down the yeah. effect. Well, guess what? Bad news. This mouse dies in three days. And the reason for that is that it turns out that the Rosa 26 locus is so good at <laughs> transcribing that gene that there was twice as much in that mouse as there was in the eight copy mouse. Ah, so this is yeah. the issues you have with transgenesis. It's really annoying because you can't control it. So we've said, forget all this. We're going to stop doing this. And instead, we've engineered <clears throat> a, a copy of the human gene that is replacing the mouse gene in the same locus that the mouse gene was in. Beautiful. Now that is being controlled in the right way. That's and beautiful. Those are the next set of, of uh, mice to get tested because I think those will give us a much, and those mice, by the way, are at least in the black six background already available on, from our catalog. So you can buy those. So, so I have a problem. It's 823, we're getting to the end of this. And Chris Balzan told me one more question, but I have, I really just received three really interesting questions. So I'm going to we'll pack them. I'm going to pack them into one. So Chris is happy. And that is, can you use these mice and really look at what we all care about? And that, those are going to be three things that came from three different people. One is anonymous. One is Alton Leslie. Thank you. And one is myself, actually. One. Leslie, Leslie has worked with me before. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. One is. Uh, can you investigate COVID-19 variants? Two, can you give Moderna and Pfizer to these mice? Three, can you give, you know, all these hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir and ivermectin, et cetera? So what can we learn from these mice from these three angles that we all care about so much and hear about so much on, in the media? Very quickly, as far as giving them things like remdesivir and other, uh, and, and, and other uh, you know, eye of newton, ear of toad and things that might work, um, of course, we can feed them anything and we will. Uh, we now need to decide what to feed them, when to feed them and how to feed them because we're gonna to try to, but, but the question is those are big experiments, they're expensive experiments and we want the perfect model. So we've sort of been waiting to do all those experiments until we have a model that we really feel will stand the test of time and, and, do, and do the experiments in the right way. One, we're still on a pretty inbred background. Two, we've got this kind of weird transgene as the way that the virus gets in. And I'm kind of hesitant to do too much on that model until if we can just wait for another couple of months and have a really great model. And then I wanna throw everything at it, the book at it and see, see which of the mice actually can um, survive or do better on these various uh, treatments. That's one. Moderna, same thing. We're actually at the moment, um, I've been trying to get some Moderna uh, vaccine, but there are two problems with that. Number one, everybody's got, got Moderna on their brain. They want to have it themselves, which is totally understandable. So what we, you know, from an ethical point of view, I'm not going to use Moderna vaccine until there's so much of it around that I don't have to worry about taking it away from a patient. But also there are these companies often have what they call, you know, research grade stuff that they would never give to a patient because it's not pure enough. And we're trying to get some of that. 
I've got one vaccine from one collaborator in California, uh, which has already gone through a phase one trial. It's neither of those two. And we're already putting that into these animals and seeing what the response is, particularly what the immune response is to that va vaccine. I think that'll be very exciting. Finally, um, the variants. Well, it's uh, obviously very scary for us as mouse people because we have two million mice sitting on the shelf up in Bar Harbor. And if those variants are capable of infecting mice, and there are some rumors that they can infect mice, then we've got an even bigger problem. Because if they infect humans and they infect mice, and mice can infect humans again, then we have a vicious circle. And that was one of the questions too, by the way. Thank you yeah. to that person. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. So. There is a bit of data out there already on BioArchive that says that two or three different mice can, of, of the strains that I showed you can be infected by one or two of the variants, South Africa and Brazil, I think. Now, the mice didn't get sick. They just produced an infectious cycle, but they didn't get sick on these viruses, maybe because there wasn't enough of it. It's not clear. But it was a very preliminary study. Um, what we're doing with some collaborators up at the Trudeau Institute, which is one of our more close um, neighbors for doing BSL-3 work in upstate New York, is to test as many mice as we can that everybody buys routinely from Jax. And we're going to run all three viruses, the UK virus, the Brazilian virus, and the South African virus, across all of the mice that are most likely to be of concern to people who are using the mice, not the PWK mouse, because nobody cares about that mouse yet. But we're talking about the big sellers. And we're going to see whether we can pick up anything at all. And we're going to look really, really carefully. We're going to look in their poop. We're going to look in their lungs. We're going to look everywhere. And if we find anything that is seriously scary there, then we have a real problem. The research community has a real problem because we've got to think very seriously about who goes into the mouse room and are they vaccinated and are they carrying one of the variants? You, you, also, you also don't want to lose your mice, just simply... Well, that's the problem. I mean, you know, the mice could get sick. And if you are, I can tell you, this is just, you know, mouse terror. I don't, uh, my mice are not in the facility that is appropriate for an infectious agent like SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So if my mouse gets sick there, that mouse is going to get euthanized faster than a speeding bullet. And I might lose tons and tons of mice, which is just horrible. So yeah, it's scary times and we don't know the answer and that's why we have to keep doing the research. All right, so Chris is up, meaning we have to stop this. David Wald and I often say that we're in the sort of in the long run here. We, we're looking really long-term for GMGI. We're building the basis and in 50 years time, you know, if we were anywhere close to where you guys are at, at the Jackson Lab, um, that would be great. And so having your talk tonight is again reminding us that it's possible and uh, we'll do everything we can to get there. Thank you so much for preparing this, for being with us and all the answers to your questions. That was really, really, really incredible. Thanks, Nadia. Thank you. Thank you for listening to all of the people who are still on the uh, Zoom. Really appreciated the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, thank you, Nadia, so much from all of us at GMGI. I can tell by the questions that were just hurling in, everyone was super engaged and really enjoying your fascinating talk. And thank you, Mark, for taking the time uh, to facilitate this and to introduce our team to Nadia. We're thrilled. Thank you also to the 1911 Trust and to James and Gail Bacon for their sponsorship and to all of you for continuing to listen, support us and uh, support our mission. If you've been inspired by tonight and by our Science Hour series, we ask that you continue supporting and contributing to GMGI. We also would love to hear your feedback. We're gonna send out a short survey next week to gather feedback on this year's science talks and to get your input on thoughts for next year. We already have September's talk lined up, um, very exciting. So stay tuned, be in touch and stay well. We are all really looking forward to connecting with you again in person, hosting our talks on the Science Hour soon, um, on the Harbor soon. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to share a quick slide to close, and um, we hope to see you all soon. <laughs>